Bonjour à tous et à toutes. <rire> euh, alors, pour commencer, je suis ravie que euh, tout le monde soit là pour euh, pouvoir accueillir l'auteur Elnathan John. Euh, just Elnathan, I begin this in French because everything I'm going to say here you already know. <rire> so, and then uh, I speak English. I do my best. <rire> alors, pour commencer, donc, euh, alors. Je pense qu'il y a beaucoup de visages que j'ai déjà vus lors du Weekend Brunch. Du coup, bah, je suis ravie de vous revoir. Et les nouvelles têtes, je suis aussi ravie de vous, de vous rencontrer. Euh, nous, on est la scène littéraire. On est une association euh, qui euh, se veut de vouloir faire la promotion des littératures afro africaines et afrodescendantes. Engagée, en plus. Donc, euh, chaque année... Enfin, on... Donc dans ce, dans, ce, dans, ce, dans ce travail de promotion, en fait, on, on décerne un prix littéraire qui, euh, donc qui va donner donc un prix à un auteur. Et c'est l'auteur, c'est El Tata John qui a reçu le prix littéraire 2019. Donc je présenterai les autres. Et l'autre travail de la scène littéraire aussi, c'est de faire des cafés littéraires. Donc j'en ai fait, euh, moi, à Paris 2. D'autres se déroulent en Suisse. D'autres se déroulent sur le continent, quand on peut. Et euh, pour cette euh, occasion, je me suis dit qu'on allait euh, se mettre avec les, les, les badages du Weekend Brunch parce que bah, j'étais allée voir et c'était super. Donc voilà, euh, pourquoi on se retrouve aujourd'hui aussi. Et donc pour le prix littéraire Les Afriques, comme on l'appelle, euh, depuis, depuis 2016, <rire> on décerne le prix. Et ici, j'ai trois des ouvrages qui ont été euh, récompensés. Voilà. Donc on a les Merkizard et les Boum. Euh, on a eu Abdelaziz Barakasakin, euh, le Messie du Darfour, chez Zulma. Donc le précédent, c'était chez la, chez la Cheminante. Et puis on a eu aussi Kay Miller, euh, Base de Réserve Babylone, euh, chez Zulma. Et puis ce sont des livres à acheter. <rire> donc à lire, en, à, du moins à lire. Euh, et donc cette année, on a le plaisir d'avoir de, décerné le, le prix littéraire à M. Nathan John pour son roman « Né un mardi », que normalement vous avez dû parcourir, <rire> vu le fonctionnement du Book and Brunch. Et euh, on a eu la, la chance de pouvoir le recevoir aujourd'hui. Alors, euh, pour pouvoir continuer mon, mon, ma petite introduction, euh, le thème qu'on avait choisi pour la rencontre, c'était... Euh, The importance of indigenous literature. Mm -hmm. mm. Euh, donc dans cette optique-là, je m'étais dit, enfin c'était l'importance des littératures autochtones en français. Et en fait, on s'était dit que comme on avait euh, cet auteur, on pouvait euh, essayer de poser un maximum de questions autour de ce thème. Donc après, euh, voilà, vous verrez si vous avez des questions ou si vous voulez rebondir. De toute façon, le, je sais que le cœur de, de, du Book and Brush, c'est de discuter du roman. D'accord Donc euh, ce que je vais faire, c'est juste dire quelques mots que... Euh, j'ai préparé pour pouvoir introduire le sujet euh, des littératures. Alors, euh, je vais essayer de le faire en anglais, donc vous ne manquez pas. <rire> faire au mieux, d'accord Je vais essayer de lire aussi un peu. Donc, euh, the, the theme uh, of the day is around the importance of uh, indigenous literature. Yeah. And, um, When we, when, we co we, when we came up with, uh, for an issue, uh, with the, the theme, uh, we, uh, we, were, we were thinking about um, the importance of telling our stories from our point of view. And what I did with the, the, the world indigenous literature, I, I put it in, uh, I googled it. And when I googled it, in the first page of Google, everything was about the Native Americans. You know, yeah. And uh, rumors has it that when you want to hide a body, you put it on the second page of Google. So I didn't went there. What I did is that I just looked for the word indigenous. And uh, in English, indigenous um, kept its root significance. Uh, people who were there, who were born there, and who were there from the beginning, before even invasions and uh, immigration. Or in French, the word uh, of indigène, we say, have um, another significance, and it has, um, uh, comment dire ça? Um, it refers to the colonial part of our history. So, 
for like 20 years people fought in order to change that, that word and to use the word uh, autochtone. So now we, we use the word autochtone uh, in order to, to talk about our culture and literature or every, everything else. So when I went to that subject, it was very large and very vast. I'm just a reader, so I, I search for things, but I, I needed to come back to our subject. And when I thought about um, writing our stories from our point of view, two things um, came uh, at, in my mind. It was um, uh, the matter of, um, I, 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 I was at school here. I, I arrived in France at 12. And when, you, you, when they teach you history, and they talk about black people, it's mostly when they talk about slavery and colonialism, see? And uh, at some point, I, I, be, I began to think that our stories begin at slavery or colonialism, and nothing before and nothing after that. So uh, it is important to tell our own story, because when you tell your story, you can this, you can decide where is the starting point. And in the matter of transmission to the next generation, the next generation, uh, we have to tell our own stories. And because representation matters too. Okay? So um, I, I was talking about that because we are here because we know the power of stories. We know how, how it, it can shape someone from the beginning to the, the adult life. And, um, and uh, we have to, to tell our own stories. And it, everything I was saying here, it was just to, to open the, the subject of the telling our stories part. So now I, I let the Dina. Dina, please. Can you tell us about the book and brush? And then we follow. Okay, thank you. So hello, everybody. Hello, Nathan. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so happy to have you. Uh, sorry about my accent because I'm not fluent, but I love English, so I'm going to, uh, I love to practice, so it's a Don't worry, we who speak English, we love the accent. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine then. <laughs> so, some of you already know me, my name is Dina, and I represent the book club Book and Branch. So, it was a concept created by a, a woman named Tina who lives in Montreal. Uh, so we meet every last Sunday of the month and we talked about a book and have a brunch. Um, and the purpose of the book club is to promote black literature. So we only, we only read about black, uh, black authors. So black? Black, black. black. African American, Africans. Yeah, and the book of the month was uh, born on a Tuesday, and I knew that the same literature was about to make an event, so we decided to do it together. So, uh, Nathan, can you please introduce yourself to the to people and maybe share some thoughts, if you like? Okay. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here, and thank you very much for coming out on a rather pleasant I hear, I hear the week was not very great weather-wise. No. There's a lot of rain and stuff. No. So it's nice that you all came out. Um, I mean, I've, I've enjoyed traveling recently with this book, especially courtesy La Cerre with the new French incarnation of the book. Um, it makes me appreciate what translation does to give books another life. And, and that's what 
what happens when books change from one language to the other. It, it gives it another life. It places it in another context. It exposes it to new eyes. And it allows even the author to appreciate their own work as seen through other people's eyes. And so that's why I'm particularly happy to be here among people who've read the book, especially in French. Um, I'm also happy that we're talking about um, things like indigenous stories and reclaiming our narratives. Uh, because one of the things that I'm interested in as well is, is history and the history of words, the history of language and the history of literature. Uh, because one of the things that the writer must do is, is acknowledge the complicated nature of language and words and appreciate that words and language and stories are never neutral. There's no such thing as neutral language or a neutral word. Every word, every narrative, every story is infused with historical, cultural, and political baggage. And so the more invested we are in the process of reclaiming our narratives, the more we seek the roots of whatever words we use, whatever words are used to describe us whatever words we use to re-describe ourselves. Um, there's not much to be said about me, but about the book. Um, I'm told that most, a lot of people have read the book it's, itself. And so I look forward to the conversations that will follow um, and after this. Um, hopefully I will read a passage or two. Um, just so you can hear my terrible voice in English. <laughs> um, and maybe you'll give me a cue when I can do that. Okay. When is the brunch? This is the most important <laughs> <laughs> Can we just skip to the brunch? <laughs> we will let you know when we feel like you're tired. Yeah, we're happy. But you're not yet, so. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. Um, I'm Didi Bori. Uh, I am a blogger, book blogger, uh, booktuber, and bookstagrammer. Uh, so I blog under the name of Brown Girl Reading. And I'm originally from uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, but I've been living in France since 1990. And uh, I'm just an avid reader. I've been reading since I was four. I love reading, you know. So uh, I'm here to help with uh, questions. And I'm going to first give you uh, just a simple overview of the book just to put everything into context. Yes. Okay? okay? All right. So Born on a Tuesday is the coming of age story of Ahmed alias Dantala. He is, an, he is a naive but bright Quranic student who falls into a gang run by Banda who befriends him. The story begins with Dantala among his friends under a kuka tree in Bayan Lai. This gang survived on committing petty thefts, uh, violent crimes, and smoking weed. After being paid to cause trouble during the election and to ultimately set fire to the opposition party's office, Dantala has no choice but to flee the scene, leaving his best friend Banda behind. He makes his way to a mosque in Sokoto where he finds food, shelter, and guidance. Recognized for his modest nature and quick aptitude, he falls quickly in the favor of Sheikh, who runs the mosque. Soon after, things become complicated and conflicted when Malam Abdul Nur, the, sh the Sheikh's chief, advi chief advisor, starts his own radical Islamic movement. Bloodshed, rioting, constant upheaval, and violence erupt around the city, henceforth forcing Dantala to decide what kind of Muslim man and friend he wants to be. So that's the context of the book. All right. So we can talk about the sex. 
She was inspired by some the story of someone. Um, yeah, at the end of the book, it's um, yeah, the Almajirid of Sokoto. So, can you tell us more about this person that you met and that you inspired uh, inspired you? And uh, because I feel when I read the book, um, like she knew where we were, the, the background, and I read also that she was born um, in this part of uh, Nigeria, the north, so you are aware of this reality. And maybe also it's a personal question, but what is your ethnic background? Because when I see Elnathan John, I don't know if you are Yoruba, or Igbo, or Aousa. Um, and also because the topic is writing in indigenous language, I know in Nigeria you have a lot um, a big literature in like in native language like for example Aousa Yoruba so if you're I don't know maybe if you are Yoruba because I saw you wrote something about Ajay further so, I don't know whatever <laughs> what so why don't you read in your native language and you, uh, why, why don't you write in your native language but you choose to write in, in English Great. <coughs> um, okay, I'll start with the first question. So, at the end of the book, I talk about a young man called Basil, who I met when I was studying law at university. And I mean, one of the things that drew me to him was the fact that, as students, uh, we we never identified these people by anything other than what they were as a group. So we, we would shout a boy or Yaro in Hausa and they would all come running, you just pick one, find the one that's not too dirty and say, Okay, wash this for me or do that. And so after that no one knew what who their name you know, no one knew their names and everything. And it struck me that often one of the first things that you can do to erase or attempt to erase a person's identity is to, is, to, is to influence what they are called. Change it, remove it, rename it. Um, and so of course, when you want to erase people, you don't talk about them. When you want to erase people, you call them something else by some other derogatory term. Or you mislead people by misrepresenting who they are. And so, which is why one of the main themes in the book is, is about names, naming, the importance of naming. What, what is in a name? And by extension, what is in the power to be able to name oneself, to be able to determine one's story, one's narrative? And by extension, one's, um, um, one's uh, life. And, and that further made me examine the life of this person that was supposedly invisible in this space. <clears throat> further triggered by the fact that at some point he disappeared and I didn't know where he was. And it's, it was instructive to me that when I asked around, no one knew or cared where he was, if he had disappeared, if he had died, if he had fallen ill. He was just a number, you know, which is why when I, when I was reading, uh, rereading 
the poor poetry of uh, Jalal Din Rumi, the Prussian poet, I found this poem of his, A Star Without a Name, particularly um, symbolic in this, in this case, where he says, um, this is how you move through the, through the world, like, you know, like a star without a name. And that, for me, was, is what the whole thing was about, how people can move through, through the world, even though they may be as grand or elegant as stars, but they have no names. And so they can be extinguished and no one would care. Um, but then, like, Arundhati Roy says, that there are no such thing as voiceless people. You know, we can choose not to hear people. We can choose to silence people, but there's no one that does not have a voice. Um, and so that's why I, I, I chose to extend the story from the short story that it first was to expatiate on, on all of the aspects of this person's life that makes him a full human being, complicated, um, multi-layered, just like anybody in the city is, you know, that they can love, that they can, that they are, they're not just a, an intellectual, they're an intellectual being as well, they're a sexual being as well, um, but then they're also an emotional being. And so all of the different aspects of this person's life, how he studies and tries to learn the world, the words that he learns, the people that he meets, how his body changes as a young man, you know, his relationship to other men, um, which was particularly important to me. Um, yeah, so this is sort of the, the back story. To that. Um, and then, oh wow, this post is certainly not made in Germany. <laughs> uh, what my, what my, my background is, uh, I'm going to skip that to, and I'm going to answer what the, the question of uh, the, the why I don't write in this language. It's a very, very interesting question. And we've been asking this question for decades. In fact, at, at the conference, and I think in Makerere in the 60s, uh, Chinua Achebe and, and Ngugiwa Thiongo had this, this thing, they, 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 and they had it for decades. They, they kept fighting over this, this question. Ngugi was the hardliner in the beginning who said, well, we should dump these colonial languages. We shouldn't speak French or English. Let's go back to, to, our, to, our, to our languages. Achebe, um, you could say, took a slightly more realist position and said, let no one be deceived that we write in English, for we intend to do unheard of things with it. And so Achebe's approach, um, while this is not a, an argument in favor or against Ngoki or Achebe, is, is about the realization of what our situation and sort of being practical and saying, well, we have been forced to speak this language. Many of us have been conditioned and educated in these languages. Many of us do not have the skills, actually, to express ourselves to the fullness, especially with, with regard to literature and philosophy and other, other thoughts in these other languages. And so a lot of people will have to make do with what they have. This is quite separate from supporting sort of moves to grow indigenous languages and to make sure that language, the language of education and the language of thought and, and business and law shifts more and more toward in the indigenous language. This is another argument, another conversation altogether. But in talking about literature, and of course, people like Ngugi disagree very strongly. Uh, Achebe says, well, we have this English, but we'll, we're making it another language. And that's why he said, we intend to do unheard of things with it, that we will appropriate it, because it has been forced upon us. Um, and I add a third perspective from someone like Dambutsu Maachera, the Zimbabwean author, who says that English is a very racist language. 
says is also a very sexist language. But to make English do what you want it to do, you have to have, he says, harrowing duels with it. You have to fight with it. Sometimes you have to remove syntax. You have to discard of grammar. You have to turn logic on its head to force it to do what you want it to do because the language was not created for us. And that's why it's a racist language if you're going to apply it in the way it was originally conceived. That's why it's a very male language because it was, because of what it was, you know, conceived to do. And so you want, you want to beat it into shape, you have to sometimes throw grammar out the door if you want to include people, if you want to include all genders, if you want to include all races and not offend people. You have to be creative with the language. And the kind of creativity that only some of us can do because of our peculiar situation. That we take the language and we say, well, this language didn't think of us, but we're forced to use it. So we'll force the language to do the things that the language was not created to do. <clears throat> I mean, it's the same in, in many other places. So for example, what feminists are doing to German, for example, which many people are very irritated by in Germany, you know, where they use things like the underscore to add other genders, you know, and, and people are like, this is very ugly. It doesn't look great on the page. But, but this is what sort of um, linguistic, uh, <coughs> activism is all about. You take a language and you say, we will snatch this language from the claws of the powerful and we will use it for our purposes. And, and the powerful often are people who are holders of power in, in the patriarchal capitalist um, um, system who, who's, who are often men White. And are often very white, <laughs> you know. And so, yes. So, so my my answer to that question is very simply that that English is a language in which I'm most proficient. However, I'm also a translator from Hausa to English, so I also work in this language. So it's not as if I don't. I I do. I use this language as well. I work in this language to tell the story. I mean, and one of the things we plan to do with my publisher is to do a Hausa translation as well. But I've chosen not to do that translation for two reasons. First, they're not paying me enough. <laughs> uh, but secondly, and most importantly, I think that translation requires certain skills that are quite different from the skills that it requires to, to write the novel. And I fully and completely respect the skills of translators. And I, in fact, it's, I think that translators should be supported and, and encouraged and, and paid and, and, and made to do things like this. So that if we, if we can develop more and more house translators who would do this kind of thing, then I think it's a good thing for me and for, for the whole body of house translators. Um, so I hope that that sort of answers that question. But even if it does, you know, you can't say anything again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, from, I'm from northern Nigeria, yes. Uh, uh, the, the, the names that I have are a function of uh, colonialism and religion. Um, so, I mean, I wish I could choose them, you know. I would just have different names. But no, I'm not from the... From the northwest and from the north. Um, my last name is my father's first name. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, my, my personal story is not very interesting. I think what's, what's more interesting for me as a writer is how we can inhabit other people's worlds. And as a writer, you will be inhabiting people's worlds outside of yourself. And even if you're writing a story that is uh, set in a place where you were born, it does not mean that, that you are perfectly suited to write that story. In fact, this is, this is where a writer must be circumspect and say, 
I need to be careful that I do not take things for granted, that I do not bring in my biases that I acquired growing up in this place, whether they are cultural or ethnic or, or even based in gender. And so I always tell people, it doesn't make it easier if you're from this place to write that story. In fact, some people one step removed might be better suited to write that story. But the, the whole the idea of this, this writing is that you know how to apply empathy in writing realist stories that first makes you aware of how hopelessly incapable you are of writing any complete story. And that the best you can do is to provide some perspective. And so I approach writing all of the realist stories that I do like walking into a room with one torchlight. And, and the room is mostly dark. And what I'm trying to do is flash a light in some dark spaces. And if you flash a light in the dark space, shadows will be cast. And even though you illuminate some parts, there will be shadows. You can't avoid that. What you can do is to say, I know where I'm pointing. I'm aware that there are shadows that will be cast. And I do not assume that I am illuminating everything completely. And with that in mind, the, right, the reader the reader will see that you've come to the story like that and they will be aware of those shadows that are cast and sometimes someone will come from the opposite direction and shine their own torch where those shadows have been cast so that they illuminate the other side and in that way writers balance each other somebody writes this story another person writes that story and in the fullness of time we might achieve something of a complete narrative. A narratives are always being completed. You know, there, there's hardly ever complete narratives. If, if all of us leave this room and we tell the story of this room, right? We would all say we were here. We'll say, of course I was there. I can tell you what happened. But you probably can't see that the woman behind you is about to kick your back. You can't see that. You're looking at me. I, I think she wants to, <laughs> you know, I can say that she was, you know, she was glaring at her, how, how, look at it, what, what, what question she asked, you know, <laughs> but that would be my story, because I saw her and you can't see her, yeah. and so unless we all tell, the, unless the only complete story of this room will be the story that all of us tell together, you know, and, and the best that the, 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 the writer can do is to say, these were the eyes with which I saw that story. It's to acknowledge that my eyes were male, so there are certain things that maybe I didn't, didn't immediately see. That I was seated in front, and so probably I couldn't see behind me. You know, that maybe, you know, I'm, I'm not tall enough to see the tops of your, of your heads, and so there were things that, you know, that I couldn't see. You know, and, and, and when, when that is done, then we were able to say, okay, what are the, what are the empty spots? So you write your story. You say, well, you know, I could see the, the top of his head. And then the reader, who is a discerning reader, reads as much as possible from as many readers as possible, from as many writers as possible, to gain as full a picture as possible. <rire> J'ai une question, mais moi je vais avoir besoin qu'on me, qu me traduise en fait. Um, C'est sur uh, l'importance d'écrire dans les langues africaines. Et um, ce que je veux lui demander, par rapport à ce qu'il a dit avant, est-ce que ce n'est pas, avec cette histoire de traducteur, parce que j'ai l'impression qu'il met beaucoup plus d'importance sur la traduction en fait, on peut écrire dans une langue dans la langue qu'on veut, et puis il faut des traducteurs pour euh, distribuer le livre dans le monde. Oui. Mais ça ne résout pas le problème quand on parle de l'Afrique, parce qu'il y a ce focus-là qu'on a, où on dit qu'il faut écrire dans des langues locales. Est-ce que lui, maintenant, en mettant en avant les traducteurs, est-ce qu'il ne refine pas la patate chaude en fait, aux traducteurs en fait parce qu'on leur demande d'écrire dans les langues. Parce que la littérature est en train de prendre tout son impact en Afrique maintenant. On leur demande que c'est à ce moment-ci 
qui doivent commencer à écrire dans les langues, dans les langues africaines. Donc, she, she's saying that, um, she's saying that it's at the moment it's very important in Africa that African writers write in their maternal language, and she she feels like maybe um, because you're putting emphasis on the translator that maybe you're pushing the, the importance more on the translator and less on the idea of writing in your maternal language. So, um, I mean, we could make this argument, and it's not an invalid one. It certainly has merit. There are many other variables in this particular argument. One of them is, like I said, there's a separate argument about uh, how do we support people who write in, in, in African languages, mm -hmm. how do we support the literature in African languages, and all of that. Um, as I am, I mean, what can I do? I, I, I write in English, and I write in Hausa, this is all I can do. Mm -hmm. I can't write in Yoruba or Igbo or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, what translation does it, is that it, it doesn't just build a body of people who change work from English to Hausa. It builds a body of readers in, in Hausa. And when you build a body of readers, you also build a body of writers. And so if there is literature in Hausa, it is likely that if kids in school read literature in Hausa, they will want to write literature in Hausa. Mm -hmm. They see that it's possible. They have a book that's, yeah. that's in Hausa. Mm -hmm. And so they'll write. So it is connected, actually. Mm -hmm. So that if there are more translators who have work, and it's not just some special thing that happens once in a while, mm -hmm. if, if there is a constant supply of books that come from the English language to Hausa and all of that, what will happen is that you will, you will have a demand for it. People will go to school to learn how to translate from English to Hausa in the same way they do with other languages. So it will, it will force schools to take that more seriously. And when that happens, it, once it enters, one, the fastest way of forcing a language is to take it into school. If, 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 if it's not the language of education, then you, know, you can do all the fancy things you want, but the language will keep dying. Unless it, be, it is a tool that is used in some practical sense. So, for example, if it's not the, I mean, Hausa is not what it is because it's the language of the market in many places. It's because it has been given power by, by, by media. Mm -hmm. It's because people are writing in the language. It's because people are making movies in the language. It's because in many places it's the language of commerce. And so unless you're using a language for some practical purpose, it's very hard to keep a language alive. Except, for example, say you have, you're a very small country with a big, big budget that can keep throwing money at people to, to, to write in that language. You know? Mm -hmm. If you're, for example, Iceland, there are more people at a party in Berlin than there, they are in the entire country. <laughs> But you know, it's a whole country, they're dedicated to keeping this language alive. The government can finance it. There are a lot of writers who are writing the language. And so the language is being kept alive. Um, that's quite different from, from say, a country where there, like Nigeria, where there are 523 languages. All of them competing for, for some kind of relevance. And all of them being utterly defeated by English. Because it's the only language of law. It's the only language of of official business. And so what we can do is, if there are more people translating into Hausa, we push it into schools as sort of an unofficial but dominant language, then probably we can, we can make the argument for it to come into official use. So for example, in some parts of northern Nigeria, we can make the argument if we have enough people reading and writing the language that perhaps the legislature where there are 90% of the people speaking the language exist, maybe they should speak Hausa. Yes. But there's also the politics of it that we must, we must not forget. And which is why I say that, you know, especially as Africans, all of these things are connected to politics. We cannot achieve any of these aims 
with our politics. The reason being that the, the tools with which we were disenfranchised and, and, and the tools with which our languages were seized were political. You know, people came, they imposed government on us. And so to get, get that back, we have to, it has to come back through politics. This, you, can't, you can't win the war through like just writing literature. Because there is, a, there is a global reality that means that we have to compete on a global scale using parameters that are not ours. There's currencies, for example, that we have to use. It's pegged to things like, say, the dollar. These, these are global realities. You know? Mm -hmm. there's, there's education, which is already in English. There is also the fact of colonialism, which has pitted people against each other. Some guy sat down and said, I'm going to draw. They sat down in Berlin and said, you know, we're going to take this place. You take that place. And so you put sometimes incongruous nations together and force them to speak one language. You bunch people together and say, all of you speak English. When, in fact, a more natural map that would have been drawn from, say, politics or trade or whatever would have, would have changed the continent completely. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the map of Nigeria, for example, would have been so different mm -hmm. if it weren't for, if it wasn't for the British. You know, that arbitrarily drew this weird shape around and said, you know, we'll just merge these two things together and call it Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And so there's that reality, we have to deal with it. In Nigeria, for example, Nigeria, so very peculiar, Nigeria, very different from South Africa, for example, where you can, in South Africa, you can speak 12 blah, blah, blah languages in public. In Nigeria, you can't. If you, if you switch from English, you are deemed to be inflicting violence on people. And so even the president, I remember the president once did a Hausa interview on BBC Hausa, and people were incensed. They were like, why are you doing a Hausa interview? Why are you shutting the rest of us out? Because there are hundreds of other languages, and it's such a, it's such a fractious situation. And so we have to deal with the politics of that as well. You know. Maybe if we say, okay, let's adopt one language, all of us on the continent, you know, yeah. might work. I don't know. But that, that, is, that, is, that is a completely, <laughs> you know, For now, as a writer, what we can do, what I can do, is to say, this English that you've forced me to speak, I'll use it. But it will not, it will not be the same language that you know. We will, we will discard the rules that you give us. I refuse to write a glossary. I refuse to italicize words. I will forcibly anglicize words. And I will use the language the way I see fit. So we have to continue. We don't have to go back and try to no, change No, I'm things. not saying what we have to do. I'm saying what, I, what, I'm, what, 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 what I'm doing now mm -hmm. with the tools that I have. Mm -hmm. While acknowledging the need for this simultaneous struggle mm -hmm. that through some political cultural other means might come to fruition before that happens i will not stop writing mm -hmm. i will not stop using english mm -hmm. english is still a dominant language is the language of my country mm -hmm. um, but then more importantly language like i said there's no, there's no good language or bad language. There's no innocent language as well. Every language has baggage. Even this, even Hausa, for example. And I was going to answer the question about, uh, um, I don't know, something you said I was going to respond to. It, it will answer the question anyway. I wanted to talk about the nuance with which we talk about our stories. So we've, I think we've moved from identifying the fact that we need stories. We've done that. We know we need stories. We know that there's, there are things lacking. We know that there's history that has been written which is problematic. We are going back. We are questioning sources. What, what we must progress to doing is adding nuance to our own stories. Is saying, yes, while we say colonial writers 
colonial anthropologists and all that did violence to us with the way they represented us, you know, mm -hmm. with the way they talked about us as savages. We recognize that. We must move to the next step of adding nuance to our own stories. He's saying, we are not just whitewashing ourselves. We're not saying, we were great before the British came. Because that would mean that it would, it would oversimplify us. Because if we are going to say we were equal to the British, when we were equal to any white person, it means we are also capable of all the things they are capable of. It means that as they are capable of love and hate, we are capable of love and hate. As they are capable of abuse of power and of magnanimity, we are capable of magnanimity and abuse of power. And so in revisiting our stories, we also want to do it with a critical eye. So for example, Hausa, Hausa is also a hegemonic language. It's a language of power. It was a language that was used to abuse other people and was used to sort of conquer other people. And so in talking about our, ind our indigenous languages, languages are not neutral. You know, so for example, if you look at the history of, of Northern Nigeria between 1804 and, and 1900, when the British sort of trampled in, you would see the, the, the dominance of the Sokoto Caliphate and what it did to smaller groups, especially smaller non-Muslim groups, whether it was as a result of slave raiding or as a result of people adopting Islam to to fit into the caliphate, or, or, or villages that were conquered and decimated because they needed them for slaves, or villages that had women that were liked by people in places like Kano, and so they were constantly being raided. And so it, it's, not a, it's not a clean story anyway. And so that's why I say whatever we, whatever we do, what we must understand is our place, the place of our history, and how we must start to retell our stories. We cannot do it just like, it was great, we were great. We have to do it with, with nuance and say, what, how complicated is our story? We remove the white people, right? We say, what, what, what were the complications in our story? And if we're bringing back languages, do we just bring them back the way they were? So now, for example, we have a Hausa language newspaper in, in, in Nigeria. And one of the things that I've, I, I, always, I was fighting with the editor was that he was replicating a bias. So for example, for, because Hausa is a very heavily um, Arabic influenced language, mm -hmm. it's also a very heavily Muslim influenced language. And so it's, it's very common to have these biases carried over into the language. And so for example, he was unconsciously using a different word for death for non-Muslims as he was for Muslims in the public newspaper. And when I pointed it out, it was like, no, the two words mean the same thing. And I said, well, that's because you're not, you're refusing to be critical in your use of this hegemonic language. That because of use and because of the certain kind of uh, incarnation of Islam that came into Nigeria, people started using a different word for non-Muslims when they died. And so they would say for a non-Muslim, Yamutu, which is the same word you would use for when an animal dies. <clears throat> but when, when, when a Muslim dies, they will say, Yarasu, meaning with something like, we lost him. And so he was using these distinctions. He wasn't aware of it. You know, and that's why you know, we, it's, it's, a, it's a huge job. And I don't think it's something we can rush. We, must do it carefully, slowly, deliberately, so that we do not replicate these, the hegemonic sort of characteristics of the, the colonial languages that were imposed upon us, mm -hmm. or the, the, the sort of the patriarchy that it came with, you know, mm -hmm. that we do not replicate it, because our language, this house has a lot of that as well. It's very, very male language. My last question, and uh, <coughs> my mouth, is about, uh, you, you say that you, you have to, to struggle with English, it is the word, lutter, yeah, lutter avec l'anglais, struggle, yes. So, um, when you finish this struggle, uh, it can be in English or in French, um, English or French, at least can you say that it became an African language, you know? Um, no. No. No, never. 
I, not never, Even if you but, change it. But I wouldn't say that. So the thing is, what I'm not, so I, I'm, I'm used, like, you know, I, I, I think you were there when I was using an example, and, and using English for me is like using a, a bad knife, a knife that has no handle. It, and it's sharp, both edges are sharp, but it has no handle. And so, as you cut with it, it can do its job, but it can very easily hurt you. And so the person who is aware of this takes special precautions. You cannot use it the way a person who has a brand new knife that has a, a plastic handle would use it. You know, mm -hmm. let the British do that. <laughs> If we are using the language, we use it like a, like a bad knife. It doesn't have a handle. It's sharp on both edges. And so we, 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 we take care, we say we wrap it a certain way. And when we are cutting, we are always aware. The others, they can decide to just use the knife anyhow they want. This is their business. But for us, because we know the pain of what history has done to us, we know the violence that this language has done to us and to our languages. We know the violence that it does to us as human beings, to our dignity, to our ability to tell stories, <coughs> to our ownership of, of stories. We use it like that knife. And so if it means wrapping it, you know, with, with gauze or, or, or whatever, we do that. And we are constantly conscious that this thing might slip out of my hand. You know, and that's why I say we struggle with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <coughs> yes. Uh, um, I, I try to find the word to say uh, I'm not disappointed, but uh, it is about the, the way you talk about the language um, and uh, share, the check. Uh, that uh, was for me the, maybe the most um, bienveillant. Uh, caring, yeah, caring. Caring, yeah, caring. Caring, yeah. caring uh, man of the book. Uh, he, he began to consider uh, Ahmad uh, at the point he, he understood that he was speaking English. So the, I think he, he, he could have so much uh, other, other way to, uh, to, to make Ahmad uh, <coughs> being, consider, being considered by, uh, by Cher. So yes, it's, um, I, don't, I don't really manage to, to find my, my, my feeling about it, but I wanted to share it um, with you. I mm have -hmm. um, another question. Uh, is, I see that you are also a lawyer. So why, uh, do you, why did you decide to write your first book? Uh, which, this is it's an interesting observation. Actually, no one, I've never heard this observation before. Um, I think that there are many points at which Sheikh increased in his trust for, the, for, for Arthur. And it, it, it wasn't just at that point. Um, you know, it started slowly, you know. And it started not just through him directly, but through sort of his deputy, where he starts to identify him as that guy, you know, let's, let's bring him in. And then he says, oh, what's your name? And so my name is is Dr. Nah, it's no, not a good name. name. Like you know, it, it starts there yeah. with the name, you know, and then it it grows, it grows, it grows, and even at the end, it doesn't really, it's not full because yeah. when he asks for his daughter, mm -hmm. you can see that he steps he steps back a little mm -hmm. because he's not really there. So it's this incremental trust I sought to build. You know, when he walks in on him masturbating, mm -hmm. that's one added layer. So there are many steps, that's not just that. It's like it was increasing. Um, well, that was, what, so that was one step. So for him, he showed an aptitude that other students didn't show, you know, an interest that other students didn't show, you know, because he already has shown aptitude for Arabic. This is clear. And that's why he's in, inside, because he's very good in Arabic. You know, he learned the Quran properly. And then that's what one, one further, because Sheikh, as you know, is not just interested in his small enclave. He's interested in bigger things, international things. And so this is quite useful to him, that this guy from nowhere, you know, is, is doing something bigger than what the others are doing. So, you know, 
perhaps you saw a larger jump, but I would say that there, there were many, many points of incremental trust. Um, lawyer. <laughs> I mean, every lawyer wants to write a book. Lawyers like the sound of their own no. voice. <laughs> they want, they want, to, you know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So I mean, they're always trying to do. They have a, they have inflated egos. They always think oh. they can do stuff. Maybe that's why I thought I could do a book. But, but I think that studying law, I always say it, it. One of the things that it taught me is to is to never trust one narrative. Is to always question all sides. That even the well most well put together narrative can be false, can have holes. And it's the way that I see the world, it's the way that I approach the world, that that no matter what somebody says, that all you need to do is to probe with the right questions and you can you it, it, it can unravel. And it, it, it's very useful in fiction because as a fiction writer, what you, what you need to do is to show as many sides as you, 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 you need to, to present a, as full a character as you need to. You, know, you will never be able to get every single side, you know, but, but you need to have both the empathy to understand the limitations of this character and sort of the, the strength to probe and ask what, what is lacking, what, what could be there that isn't there. And then the reader can see it. The reader can see, okay, this is a problematic character, this is not a problematic character, this is a is a bad character, is a good character, and that, that no character is wholly bad or wholly good, you know? And they can see the whole range of things. Um, but then I think I got bored being a lawyer. It's, it's, for me, it's, it's slightly boring, because um, there's a lot of hierarchy. You have to say yes sir, yes sir for a long fucking time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to say it for a long time, you know? And, if you're in court, the, you know, I don't know how it is in, in other places, but in Nigeria, the court says, your father's a donkey, you have to first say as the court pleases. If you're a lawyer in court, if the judge says, you know, your father's a donkey, you say, as the court pleases, um, we, will, we will respectfully um, urge this court to reconsider. <laughs> Uh, my father being a donkey. <laughs> if the court pleases, you know. And I'm not, you know, I don't have time for that. Yeah. I want to just say fuck you to the judge. <laughs> but uh, you can't do that, otherwise no, you, you you'll be in jail. No. Yeah, so it's a bit, it's a bit, it's, it bored me a bit. You have to follow this long process and you know, not for me. I'd rather follow the long process with the book. more interesting question is, like I said earlier, that as we revisit all of these things, what we do first is to ask the questions, is to raise the, uh, the issues that need to be raised, namely, why do we speak the languages that we do? You know, not necessarily providing the answers immediately, but why? If we know why, then we can ask, what do we want to do now? we want to throw it all away. Now, if we're revisiting our old languages, how do we want to do it? And it's a nuance I talked about earlier. You know, say for example, our ancient religions. I think that if we had a natural evolution, many of our religions would have died. Because this is what, this is the nature of these things, right? Some religions come into being to serve, to fulfill a certain purpose. And they outlive their purpose, you know. People, people have new lights and they say, okay, well, we shouldn't do this. Some religions, for example, kill twins. And of course, people outgrow that. They say, no, no, we can't do this, you know. It's, 
it's wrong. Or religions that are misogynistic, that say women can't eat cola nuts, for example. If you, you know, or cultures that say that. You know, where where I'm from in Kaduna, women don't inherit. Women who are married don't inherit from their parents. So for example, if my, my grandfather died, my mother would not be able to inherit anything. It would just be her three brothers who would share their whole property. This is their culture. You know? And so, like I said, we also have to be critical of the cultures that we receive and that in fact people don't live by themselves without contact with others. You know, people adopt languages, they lose languages. They adopt cultures, they lose cultures. You know, cultures merge because of certain historical facts. But then the real issue is knowing what it is, knowing what the problems are, knowing what the situation we are, what situation we're in. And when we know them, we can start to chart a course. Do we want to go left or right or straight or back? What are the merits of going back or straight? And you know, as a writer, I'm not, I'm not as, especially as a fiction writer, I'm not, this is not a political treatise. I'm not giving a lecture about what should be done about these things. I'm telling a story about a person whose story is often obscured by the larger stories. And that's what's most important. That the life of this person is as important as my life. It's as important as the life of the nice intellectual who goes to a Paris cafe to, to see coffee, you know, and talk about French philosophers and intellectuals. And you have dozens of books, boring books about that, about people sitting in cafes just talking shit philosophy. You know? But there are other lives, other lives that matter, and that's the point of this book. And that these lives are as multi-layered as the lives of those cappuccino sipping philosophers. I think that's the point. Understand. Thank you for understanding. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to make a, a break, a ten minute break. I'm sure that you have to eat. I was going to say, all come back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes? So, okay. do you agree that when I read them, come back? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You just all be silent. <laughs> I just, oh, you can just put your hands on your chest. Okay. <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs>